Hey, what's going on everybody? Welcome back to Auto Transport Intel. It is Wednesday. It is noon central time. That means it is time for DOT compliance. And that is with your DOT guy, Brian Riker. He is our resident expert and he wants to answer your questions. So go ahead and jump in the live chat. Go ahead and chime in, ask your questions. Any DOT, FMCSA, IRP, IFTA, questions, clearing house, trailer registration, truck, trailer, man, he covers it all. So in fact, he's on the road again, so he's going to be joining us by audio only. Before we get started, I just want to say uh, thank you. Thank you so much for joining. And please do leave a like. I appreciate that as well. And also, uh, you can help a friend. If you see the share button below the video, click share, click copy, grab that YouTube link, text it, email it, share it on social media, send it to a friend. If you know somebody that maybe they're headed towards a problem at the scale or they're just not doing something right or you've had a disagreement about a regulation or a rule and you could use some professional guidance or they could, this is the show. We're going to be live for 30 more minutes. If you missed the show live, go ahead and leave a comment below, below the YouTube video. And also, go to autotransportintel.com. Click on sign up. Become an ATI insider. Again, help a friend. They can get a free first talk with Ty Thompson at Cars on the Move. Maybe join a roundtable discussion. Get on the email list. Auto Transport Intel wants to help. That's what we're all about here. Um, and building the community helping, and it's not just carriers, but brokers and dealers that are looking for uh, trusty auto shipping, or maybe you've got a technology question, or maybe you want to talk about, you know, should I get into new or used or auctions, dealers, how do I talk to dealers? We do all those things here, but I've said enough. Thank you so much for joining the live chat. <coughs> Two Bears Transportation is here. I'm here at the VA getting blood drawn. It's storming in Mississippi. Thanks for saying hello, David, and stay out of the rain. Silverman, all trucks next right. Hello, what's up? What's going on? Uh, Victory Lap Transport, major blitz on I-95. You better be ready. Wow, that's right. We got the road check going on. Uh, John and Luann say hello. What's going on? I'm in North Carolina heading north on I-95. On I Who isn't? Getting my windshield replaced in the morning before leaving. Ooh, right. The windshield question. That's cool. A guy on CDL Life said his authority was suspended. Ah, okay, yeah. Give him Brian's link. That's good. Because even though Brian is with us today to answer questions, if you're in need of help, you need a longer conversation, and keep his number handy. Shoot, you never know, man. You might be at the scale, and uh, you, you're in so much trouble, they took your phone away. So there's your... Uh, and you can't Google, right? You can't Google. All right, so there's the phone number. There's the email address. Send him a smoke signal. John Cochran is here as well. What's going on? LAI Auto Transport in DC. Thank you guys so much when you put your company information. I really, I love that. Um, it drives it home. Do it every show. Every show, share your info. Should be a new slogan. Sounds like a t-shirt. Okay, without further ado. Hey, Brian, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can, Jay. Good afternoon. Hey, good afternoon. Uh, can you hear me all right? I Yes, I hear you. I can't see you. You no, are... No, I apologize to the audience. I don't have a strong enough signal to stream video right now. All right. Well, that's cool because I think, I think if we had to pick audio versus video, we'd probably take audio so we can get that advice. Sure. I, I mean, I'm, li I'm like an old... 70s rock star i'm much better off before video came around <laughs> you know that's where a lot of radio guys right you hear you know this yeah your, video killed the radio star video killed the radio star it killed the djs once they had to start putting cameras in the booth and now we've got all these pretty sexy yuppies not real djs that know their craft <laughs> wolfman jack was like ryan seacrest who <laughs> amen my friend <laughs> Actually, right. Ryan, I, I just want to say, I think Ryan Seacrest actually does a pretty good job, but I think he's kind of, yes. worn, he's, I think he's a little worn out. The guy works every day, whatever. Yes, but he's, he's no Wolfman Jack. He's no, uh, uh, he, he's, he's definitely no old school DJ. Right now, somebody's like, 
why are they talking about Ryan Seacrest? Let's move on. <laughs> well, remember, I wanted to be a radio host all my life. I used to pretend I was Dr. Johnny Fever from WKRP when I was a little kid sitting in my bedroom with my desk lamp pretending it was a microphone. Dude, that is awesome, man. <laughs> that is awesome. I wonder, hey, how many, how, many, how many people out there pretended to be a trucker? You know there's somebody <laughs> sat at the oh, kitchen sure. table that took the plate off the dinner table and they pretended they were driving? I'm sure of it. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> uh, oh. Let's see here. Okay, I like how, so David, by the way, um, we got David here on the screen. Thank you, David, for this. I bet you can't stump your DOT guy, Brian. So it's time. If you've got a stumper, go ahead and post it in the live chat. It's, nobody stumps Brian. But they're going to try. And um, and I like how... So David was pointing out, yeah, a guy on CDL Life said his authority was suspended, so he gave him... he gave, David gave him your link. I appreciate that, David. I have not heard from him yet, but I appreciate that. I'll see what I can do to help him. Well, he's probably still at the uh, he's probably still at the way station. What do they make you do? Like five hundred laps around the building, or what? no? <laughs> no, this is not Catholic Church where we do <laughs> hail marys and penance, and then you're good to go. You know, it's funny you say that because I had looked at a rosary as another uh, prop on the show. <laughs> What's a rosary? Um, okay, <laughs> let's see here. Uh, John, how are you making out in the DMV? Rates are pretty good right now. Hey, Victory, I'm just getting started. It should be up and running. Ah, uh, yes, Wolfman, <laughs> and, and and we're in Cincinnati. Well done. Me too. Just bought my trailer cash bought to buy a truck in 60 days. See you are out there. Let's talk about the road check. What's going on with the road check right now that you know of? All right. It is the largest single coordinated enforcement effort in North America. And this year it's May 4th through 6th. So yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And they expect to inspect one truck every, I think the statistics, 46 seconds. Uh, it's coordinated between Canada, U.S., and Mexico. Yes, Mexico does commercial vehicle enforcement. They even know they pick on the guys south of the border. They actually do have CVSA members and follow rules very similar to ours. Uh, so what I'm seeing is states like New York, they always play their own way. So they were all set up yes, uh, last week, and they did their 72-hour blitz a week early. Uh, I drove down from Pennsylvania to Georgia, and I'm driving back uh, today. And I noticed a lot of extra enforcement officers in the way stations and extra motor carrier officers on the road, but I haven't really noticed the increased number of trucks being inspected. Uh, that said, we'll get the results in about a month on what they made out with it. But the focus this time is driver paperwork and lighting defects. Lighting defects are very simple for the driver to spot and correct. Um, <clears throat> and then driver paperwork, ELD, hours of service uh, for paper logs, uh, and having things such as bill of lading or shipping documents to prove the cargo you're hauling belongs on your truck. That's what they're looking for this year. Of course, they will do full level one inspections on as many trucks as possible, but their key focus is lighting and driver paperwork. Mm -hmm. I remember we had read something about, uh, yeah, you can, there's, it's more <laughs> effective to fix what maybe like equipment problems rather than behavior problems. Mm-hmm. Mm hmm. And so yes. these are both even though it, it's driver paperwork is interesting because that's a crossover between equipment and and behavior. Yes. Well, they are looking at it for mostly hours of service component, which they still believe fatigue plays a large part in roadside safety. And while it is true, you cannot be as safe and effective when you're tired as you are when you're properly rested. The crash statistics show that. <clears throat> Fatigue plays a part in very few truck-involved crashes when they look at the actual causation of the crash. I don't have the statistic in front of me, but I, I know it's very few that fatigue actually plays a role in it. Yeah. But again, it's easy for them to enforce, to look at the logbook or the ELD and say, oh, the computer says you're tired, so you're tired. Um, 
you know, let's say you are, let's say you're new to the trucking business. Um, can you rely on your ELD to just take care of the problems for you? Or is there, a, how much information and education do you need personally to comply with all the hours of service rules with your ELD? You really need to know the rules of the game because there are so many ELD products on the market and ELDs are self-certified. There is no governing body that says, yes, XYZ device meets all the standards and works perfectly. You really need to know the rules because I have seen some low quality ELDs that will allow you to make hours of service violations and not warn you. And I've seen some high quality devices that warn you long before you're going to go into a violation status. So you really need to know the hours of service rules inside and out. You can't rely on that computer to tell you when you have time to go. You need to make sure it's working properly. You need to know the hours of service to properly plan your day ahead anyhow. And when your ELD goes down, you're required to carry paper logs and revert to paper logs while your ELD is being repaired. You have up to eight days. It could be extended with an extension request, but you have at least eight days when your ELD malfunctions to get it repaired that you need to be on paper. And if you don't know how to complete a paper log properly, you're going to be in a world of hurt because those violations will count. And the enforcement officer doesn't want to hear, well, my ELD normally does it for me. I've never filled paper out. So it, it's very important to know these rules of the game and also to make sure that you're when you are being inspected and they point out a violation that it is really a violation so that you know what's going on either a so you can learn from it or b so you can try to respectfully dispute it i know it's a dry topic hours of service in eld but yeah it seems like you could write i mean if you're if you're being stopped and questioned and they think you don't know they're gonna possibly take advantage of that Sure, I wouldn't say they're going to deliberately take advantage of it, but you as the motor carrier, and this is particularly important for the owner operators that are out here, which are a large portion of our audience, you have two hats you wear, motor carrier and driver. Well, you as the motor carrier have a duty to know these rules. When you apply for your authority, one of the check boxes on the application is, I am familiar with, understand, and agree to comply with the Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Regulations. And so it may sound as simple, okay, it's a box I checked, whoop de doo but that compels you to know these rules. And that's why they can levy you fines without a due process for not following the rules. That's why on the side of the road, ignorance is not an excuse. They expect you to have known the rules of the game before you started playing the game. You wouldn't go out on the baseball diamond and try to play a game of baseball if you knew nothing about the rules. It's the same thing here. It really is. And I'm horrible with sports analogies because I'm not a big sports fan, but you get the picture. Well, I do, and I appreciate it. And that's the thing is that I... Uh... You know, I, I wouldn't, I, I, I might be remiss in the way I painted that picture. I'm not, I don't want to say that, that any enforcement wants to take advantage of, of somebody on purpose, but when, with the, with the level of responsibility on the commercial motor vehicle operator, if they detect a serious weakness in your education or ability, it could be a problem. See? It's such a problem that we went silent. I, now, if we lost Brian, he will be back. By the way, okay. in the live I chat, I had my phone oh, on Do Not Disturb. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, okay. So there's a question. John Finest Tone Recovery has raised a question. Let's see. Is going to reboot. So can you guys? Can Can everybody else see me and hear me? Okay, I've got what I've got. I have another computer that I watch the stream on to make sure it's. And I see it. I see it and I hear it on my other computer over here. So I think we're okay and we're going to keep going. But I always want to double check and appreciate you guys tuning in. Also, hey, uh, Brian, you, you are with us, right? 
Yes, I'm still here. All right, cool. So Chris Chamberlain has a question um, about total length tr of truck and trailer. I'm going to get my Ram 5500 all ready. I have a 48-foot take three. When registering the truck, the cab and chassis, uh, okay, when registering the truck, i.e. cab and chassis, register it as a tractor? If your state allows you to register it as a tractor, that is your best option. Now, there are a couple of things to consider here, because what you're getting at is the overall 65-foot truck and trailer rule that most states enforce, where if you have a truck with a trailer, you cannot be more than 65 foot from the front bumper of the truck to the rear of the trailer. In some states, that includes your load. If you're a tractor trailer, then they're only concerned with the length of the trailer. There is no overall length limit on a tractor trailer combination by federal law. So if your state allows you to register your truck as a tractor, and it qualifies as a tractor because it doesn't have a finished hauler body or pickup truck body on it. So if it qualifies as a tractor, then that is your best option if it's available to you, yes. And I don't think he mentioned the state, but I want to say he's in PA. Will that make a uh, difference? Pennsylvania might be an issue. Pennsylvania is one of the few states that very strongly enforces their reconstructed vehicle process. Technically, in my home state, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, simply to install a fifth wheel hitch in a pickup truck requires a reconstructed vehicle inspection so that we can rebrand the title. So check with your dealer, check with your uh, tag and title agent in Pennsylvania and see if that applies in your case. I should know those rules. I used to do license plates in Pennsylvania, but uh, I haven't in a long time. So, uh, but yes, Pennsylvania, you may have to have a reconstructed inspection to rebrand it as a PT, we would call it in Pennsylvania for tractor. Oh, and he, Chris says he's in New Jersey. Okay, New Jersey, I'm not exactly sure on. You have to look into it. Um, I may be able to look it up. I, one of these days, I'm going to put a reference guide for all of these together. These are common questions I get every day that I have to go back and research. <laughs> well, you know, it's understandable. There's a lot to it. Um, and, you know, when you say, like, check in, you know, like, logistically, can you, can you make a phone call to, I mean, you're probably not, you know, I don't know. Can you? Can right you right now, in? it's hard to get somebody on the phone, and I don't trust say. the advice on the people at the motor vehicle agency on the phone. Right. Uh, what you want to do is find a copy of New York, of New Jersey's motor vehicle code and read what it says for truck size and weights, truck registration. It's absolutely riveting. You better have a couple cups of coffee before you do it, <laughs> so you don't fall asleep. Uh, or the easiest thing to do is join like the new uh new jersey motor truck association i think that's what they call their trucking or garden state trucking association mm. or the garden state towing association they have legislative resources available that may be able to help answer those questions and if not send us an email if you don't find an answer easily and i'll i can't promise you i'll get back to you right away but i'll get back to you in a couple days on it cool very cool um, Carlos ACB Logistics is with us. What's up, Carlos? And John at Finest Towing Recovery is back. Okay, so can, John, can you see us and hear us okay? I hope so, and I appreciate you tuning in. Let's talk about One Strap Charlie. Sure. <laughs> what? So you saw this picture. What? What? So what? What trailer do you? And I know Brian's. You know. Uh, is on the road or whatever, but you saw this image earlier. What do you, what do you think is going on here? I think we have somebody that either does not understand cargo securement rules, or is trying to be as minimally com compliant as possible. Contrary to popular belief, four straps is not always legally required. But stop! Don't that doesn't mean I'm telling you you can get away with two straps. The industry standard is four points, four straps. And if you don't meet industry standard, regardless of whether it was legal, you still could be liable for 
death or injury that results from that car coming loose or you having a crash. So it's always best to comply with your industry standards. Now, what I mean is if you're subject to the federal regulations, transporting wheeled vehicles that weigh less than 10,000 pounds can be secured with a minimum of two straps if you can do it in a, mat, in a way that secures it from front, back, side to side motion. And I'm not sure if his straps, I can't see the front of the trailer to see what else is up there, but I, I don't like the strapping method used here at all. See, and I, based on what I see, it looks like it might also have a strap on the front right. Maybe. And so if he's got front right and left rear or left front, right rear, crossed from each other, and the straps are in good order and they're properly installed, that meets the absolute minimum of right. DOT requirement, assuming they're rated properly as well. You can't just take some Harbor Freight special for a strap. You have to have a strap that's properly rated. That car that's on there is probably, I'm going from memory on the photo now, but that's probably a three or 4,000 pound car. And so you gotta be able to secure 50% of that weight so you need straps that are rated for half of the weight of the car, uh, which sounds simple enough given most of your regular wheel straps we use in this industry have anywhere from a 36 to 4,700 pound weight rating on them. But the way you apply the strap, there's a chart in the federal regulations that reduces the rating of that strap. So really the rule of thumb is make sure you have an aggregate amount of straps that's equal to the load you're securing so if his straps are in good shape and properly rated, two straps might be barely legal, but it sure is not professional. Um, John sent this over, and um, yeah, he was on. Uh, so he was on I ninety on I ninety five coming out of Florida, I believe. And he also says the New Jersey State Police will pull you over for straps blowing in the wind. Yes. Um, and I don't think this is. I don't think it's strapped over the tire, based on what I can see. Yeah, I couldn't tell that that well on right? my little screen. I mean, I don't know if it's over the bumper or an axle, and it looks like in front of the sedan there's an SUV, and maybe maybe each vehicle has one strap. I don't know if if his straps <laughs> got stolen. Do you think he's on the clock, or is this a person? Does it matter? It, it could be a guy that bought some cars at the auction for himself, but it doesn't matter. It, yeah. You still have a duty to be safe on the road, whether you're a professional an amateur, a dealer moving your own inventory, it does not matter. And in the latter of those, the dealer moving his own inventory or the rebuilder moving his own inventory, that's still a business purpose. That's still fully regulated transportation. The only thing you don't need is a motor carrier number because you're private, not for hire. So you're private motor carrier property, but you still have to secure the stuff properly. I mean, think about all the people we see when it's time to move at the end of the month with mattresses strapped to the roof of their car and they're folded up and ready to fall off. And it's no different here. You have, a, as a fellow human, you have the duty to do it safely and properly. Well, and you just made me think, I mean, you've got, for dealers that move their own inventory, and we know there's a lot of them, um, as you stated, it's not for hire, so they don't have to have DOT numbers on the side of the truck, right? Well, but, no. Yeah, no, so I was just on, say, yeah. Depends on the size of the truck they're using. Right. Uh, and if they're interstate or intrastate, the mm -hmm. rules get very fuzzy at this point. But even if they don't have to display a U.S. DOT number, there's still going to be state laws, which normally mirror the federal laws on cargo securement, that will apply to these uh, private fleet operators and if they go across state lines to pick up their cars even as a private dealer then yes they do need a u.s dot number they just don't need an mc number to go with it i'll bet dot uh enforcement loves dealers when they transport their own cars why do you think they hang out outside the auction parking lots uh, oh. in, 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 in Pennsylvania? And again, I have a lot of good friends with Pennsylvania Motor Carrier Enforcement, personal friends. But in Pennsylvania, we get a lot of car dealers that we can get a $36 license plate for our tow truck. It's called a repair towing tag instead of the $300 bait normal price for that tow truck. Well, these dealers have a little garage or whatever. They want to go to the auction with their tow truck that they use normally for towing 
grandma who broke down on the highway off the highway, well, that's not the right license plate for what they're doing. Or they go to the auction with a dealer plate, buy a pickup truck and a car and tow it behind it. That's not the appropriate use of our dealer plate. We're not allowed to transport a load on the dealer plate. So motor carrier loves to sit outside the auction in some states and find these violations. And John says that he did not have not for hire on the truck. Yeah, not for hire doesn't really mean much. A lot of people think they can slap that on in what looks like a commercial vehicle and get away with doing anything they want. But this is probably just a guy that doesn't care or doesn't know any better because he hasn't been caught yet. How many people do we see in the forums that want to be a hot shotter and they bought a pickup truck and a trailer and they started hauling a load and only after they get caught the first time do they realize they need authority or other compliance issues? Um, This really is very interesting and makes me think that uh, as we were talking about um, driver uh, driver recruiting, driver training, driver shortage is an interesting topic. This too, uh, helping dealers remain DOT compliant. Wow, I, I didn't even realize. I hadn't thought of that. That's well, huge. Think, think about this. You deal with dealerships a lot. Most of your dealers out there have compliance companies that help them maintain compliance with title Mm -hmm. regulations, Mm -hmm. financing regulations, Mm -hmm. OSHA, health, safety, and environment, environmental regulations for disposing of their oil. But very few of them think about DOT compliance. And here's the catchy, the screwy part. The dealer that's selling an RV or the dealer that's selling that Ram 5500 dually if they're selling it to a private person, doesn't matter. whoop de do that person can come in with their regular driver's license and drive it away. But, well, the dealer has it in their possession and the dealer is moving it around and prepping it for sale. It's considered a commercial vehicle and the dealer's employees need to be a qualified driver in most states to operate that vehicle. I'm talking medical card and they get into a larger uh larger motor home possibly even a cdl and right. uh, yet you can sell it to somebody for personal use that does not have a medical or a cdl and it's legal so hmm. i work with a couple of large dealership chains that recognize this and this is uh, so for our dealer friends that are listening if you're selling these vehicles that are over ten thousand pounds gross maybe you want to get a little phone call in and a little consultation to make sure you're Porter, your lot guy that moves it around, is qualified to do so. Wow. Fascinating. Um, we only have a few minutes left. I want to make sure I get to Danny B. Hey, Jay and Brian. Question for Brian. When you transport a dually on the wedge and the rear sides of that dually are sticking out a bit, is that considered a violation? Great question. It's going to depend on exactly how wide you are when you mean sticking out. If... Uh, If you have the dually perfectly centered on the wedge trailer, then in theory, the fenders on that dually should not exceed 102 inches wide and should be centered and you shouldn't be wide. When they measure you for compliance, if you've got that off-centered, they're going to go to the furthest point off-centered on the dually to the right or the left to the furthest point of your truck that sticks out on the opposite side. And so if you're greater than 102 inches wide or 96 in the states that don't allow 102 wide trailers and load, then yes, it is a problem. Generally, no, it's not. One of the issues that is a problem when you're transporting larger vehicles on your trailer is if you fail to fold the mirrors in. The mirrors can only stick out wider than eight foot when we're actually using them as safety devices. When we're towing or transporting the vehicle, the mirrors need to be folded in so that they're not wider than eight foot. It's one of those little crazy nuances of a law that very rarely gets in for enforced, but when there is an issue, it's an issue. So short answer for your question, if the dual is perfectly centered, it should not be a problem. Interesting. And so on the mirrors, folding when in doubt, fold in the mirrors? Yes, which you should anyhow, because it's real easy for mirrors to get broken when you're transporting them on, especially if you back something on. The yeah. mirror's not designed to go down the road at 70 miles an hour in that direction. It's an old habit I had from when I was mm. hauling that I folded the mirrors in on everything I put on my truck. 
Um, so 102 inches is that the, that's the magic number of width overhang. That that's the fed that's the federal width for combination vehicles. 102 inches. Uh, some states allow a little more. Some states restrict what routes a 102 wide can be on. You'll see in uh, Pennsylvania there are street signs that say no trucks over 28 and a half foot long or 96 inches wide. You'll see in New Jersey the little green circle sign no 102. So again, you gotta. But on the federal highway system, the national network, your interstate highways, uh, 102 wide is allowable. Um, it's normally not a problem until it is a problem. You get those, sometimes you get those small jurisdictions that want to enforce that width as a way of keep, excuse me, of keeping trucks off of their roads. Hey, uh, we only have a couple minutes left, but follow up question on One Strap Charlie. Isn't a over the wheel count as two points? No, common misconception. It may you look at it not the points it makes contact on your vehicle, on your vehicle, your trailer, your truck, but where does it make contact on the load you're hauling? It touches one spot, the tire. Now, if the strap went, if you were taking a cargo strap like they do on flatbeds hauling building materials, let's say, and went up, over, and down then that's more or less two points of contact, but they don't look at it as points of contact in that industry. But no, in our industry, it grabbed the wheel. The wheel is one point of contact with the cargo. That's what they're looking for. Amazing specificity. Gosh, thank you so much, Brian. I do want to get to Johnny Edwards. This is, man, he's opening a big topic, but it's such a great question. Where can you find car haul training for new guys with a dually truck? Very good question. Uh, there's not a lot available. There was a car hauler academy run in Florida for Stinger operators, and I believe that school has closed. But to the best of my knowledge, there is not a school for dually trucks right now. Uh, it, it's something that we probably should have, uh, and I appreciate you asking that question. It shows that you're trying to do it right, which that that's what we want to promote here on this uh this show is doing things safely legally and properly not just if i can get it on my truck i'm going to go with it um but unfortunately i don't have a good answer for you on that well i told him go ahead and sign up with ati um that'll put you in touch with ty this is not day one of that uh training school but that's the path we're trying to head down uh, and Ty is, is going to be the, your best bet right now. But um, I, I'll agree with you there. Yes, I, yeah. I didn't even think about Ty. But but Sorry, but, Ty. but well, no, but, but it's not a training school. I mean, tr Ty doesn't run a training school, um, and it's something we talk about from time to time. It's very interesting. There is a need there. Well, Ty, um, Ty has some great resources for anybody that wants to deal with him, though. So yeah. he's good. And and yeah, and the extent of my training, I. Uh, I teach defensive driving, and I teach CDL in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. I was a former examiner in Pennsylvania, but I don't teach uh, how to load a car on a truck. The, now, in the towing industry, there's a lot of great training programs that will teach you that, but I'm not aware of any for the car haul industry. Well, I think we'll get there. So, you know, we're on the way, and... Uh... And, and I, man, I, Brian, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to join us every Wednesday at noon for 30 minutes. We really You're appreciate welcome. it. I, I look forward to it. I really enjoy it. <laughs> That's so great. Um, well, I, I know we, there was a couple other things we didn't really get to. That's okay because we save it for next time. Um, but this is, since this is road check week, let's just end on a road check note. Final thoughts on road check. Check your lights every time you stop. If you get out to five minutes to go pee, walk around your truck and check your lights. It'll save you $125, $150 fine and a possible out of service. Uh, so uh, carry a few extra light bulbs with you if you know how to change them on your trailer and your truck. Uh, and make sure that you're not pushing your hours of service hard this week, that, that your log book is legitimate. Uh, and that's all. Okay, wait. Uh, we do have, I missed a question. Johnny Johnny also has necessary requirements 
for fifth wheel installation on a dually? I'm not sure what the question is there. Um, you're best off to have the fifth wheel installed by a professional upfitter uh, and try to make sure whoever's installing it understands you're not using it to pull an RV so that they put the right fifth wheel on your truck. Uh, but the, the actual installation requirements will vary depending upon the fifth wheel you purchased, the truck you're putting it on, with or without a bed, et cetera. Uh, and again, check with the state you're in to make sure that there are no re-registration re or retitling requirements after you've added the fifth wheel hitch. I'm going to go ahead and put your website in here again. Um, Johnny, I think you have maybe a few more follow-ups on that. You might want to contact Brian. You can email him. Um, and... On air at yourdotguy.com. Oh, yeah, right. yeah, let's do that. So on air, yes, and I put, okay, so email your DOT question on air at yourdotguy.com. Yes, perfect. Okay, yes. it's in I'll, the I'll do channel. my best to answer it as soon as I can. It normally takes me a day or so to get back to the email. And Johnny's in California. Okay, well, California may have some extra requirements. There. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> all you got to say is California, and there's always You're right, extra exactly. Oh, uh, California. <laughs> and, and, and by the way, don't take that personally. I spent some time in California. Big fan of certain aspects, but we know that when you say California. Yes, my oldest daughter lives out there. It's yeah. just they're different. I, I, amazing weather. Um, yes. Yes, amazing weather. Okay, man, listen, thank you so much. Everybody, thanks for tuning in to the live chat, posting your questions. And Brian, again, thank you so much. And stay safe, and we'll see you soon, Brian. Say goodbye, Brian. Thank you, everybody. See you later. <laughs> All right, see you, man. Take care. Peace.